here's what I'm going to tell you today. If we are children, if we are led by the Spirit of God, then we are children of God. For God did not give you a spirit of fear that makes you a slave. He gave you a spirit of a child. And by his spirit, you cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. Now, if God has made you a child, then you are an heir. You are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Ain't that a powerful word? I want to talk to you this morning about one of the big differences between a servant and a child, and I believe it has to do with the way either one prays. One may pray as a servant or one may pray as a child, and those are different types of prayer. And the more you pray, the more you will hear your prayers starting to, to um, satellite around uh, certain patterns. And those patterns, if you listen to them, will start to sound either more like a servant or more like a child. Um, let me tell you how you might know the difference. Ask yourself, what is the image that first comes into my mind when I start to pray? What is God doing, in other words? And what am I doing? What does he look like? What is his posture? And as a result, what is my posture? So I grew up believing that God was uh, high and exalted, seated on a throne, Isaiah 6. And so to me, God was like um, Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial, this massive throne. I know some of you are chuckling at that. But, that, I mean, I had no trouble uh, revering God. He was high and lifted up. He was on Mount Rushmore. He was the fifth face. Better than the other four. Relax. <laughs> and so my posture was always one of humility, brokenness, self-awareness. Uh, um, I, I spoke less. Second, ask yourself then, what is your main disposition while you are praying? Now, I know your disposition, your mood will be all over the place, but if you listen to yourself pray for a while, you'll notice your mood tends to run toward one disposition or another. I just said mine was mostly humility and brokenness and reverence because that strikes, that's similar to Abraham Lincoln. Third, ask yourself, what drives me to prayer most of the time? Think hard about that. Your prayers will fall into certain themes. Mine do. Yours probably do. And there are at least two predominant patterns. Some people in the room right now pray predominantly because you want to know more about God. You want to talk to him in familiar terms. And so it has more to do with that Friendship, in other words, knowing him more fully. And others in the room right now pray more often in need. And it's in order to get something. I don't mean that in a selfish sense because everybody does it. But it, that's what drives you to your prayer. Something has happened and you have to move into your prayer. And your prayer begins by you asking for something. And fourth, ask yourself, what effect do I think this is having uh, on my prayer life or on the rest of my life. And I want to suggest this morning that to pray like a child is a fundamentally different kind of prayer. Not in the language, but in the disposition. Henry Nouwen tells a great story about three Russian monks that are living alone on an island. Nobody else lives there. Nobody ever goes there. One day a bishop decides to go pay them a visit, and when he lands, he discovers that the three monks don't even know the Lord's Prayer. 
So he starts to teach them the Our Father. He spends a week teaching them the Our Father. Then he gets on a boat and goes back to the mainland. But as he pushes away from the island, he notices that the three monks are running after him. They're walking on the water, running after the bishop. And they're shouting, Father, Father, we have forgotten the prayer. And the bishop turns and says, well, how then are you praying? And they said, well, we just say, dear God, there are three of us and there are three of you. Have mercy on us. And the bishop said, well, go back to your island and pray like that. <laughs> I mean, they're having plenty of success. There's the difference. It says now on between prayer and prayerfulness. Prayer is a particular expression that has a beginning and an end. It follows a theme. It's either praise, it's petition, it's thanksgiving, it's confession, it's intercession. It has a theme, but it has a beginning and it has an end, and we pull ourselves away in order to do it. But prayerfulness is the spirit. It's the mindset that we take into the prayer before we ever utter a word. And I'm wondering if that is where things break down. What I know, at least from the Pew Research Forum, is that in the room right now, one-third of us pray seldom to never. If we are representative of the greater public, another third of us pray one time a week or less, and the remaining third more often than that. So I'm not assuming that everybody here prays like three Russian monks. And I believe the thing driving so much of our prayers right now, whether we pray for everything or almost nothing, whether we, uh, whether we pray in public or in private, whether we enjoy our prayers or whether we don't, I think it has more to do with the mindset that we have when we go into prayer than it is with the language itself. And think about this. We are always reading books and hearing people talk about prayer, but they're talking about techniques. And we're thinking, if I can just find a better technique, then I can use that it's not the technique. It's the spirit or the mind that we take into the prayer. When the mind changes, the prayer changes. So I want to introduce a revolutionary idea this morning. A few, uh, just one year ago, about this time, we had our first grandbaby. Well, we didn't have them, but you know what I'm talking about. After something like what I consider a miracle just after the child was born, uh, he's grown up to be a healthy child now. I have spared you pictures for 12 months. It's time. <laughs> Come on, put the first one up. We got it? Do you have it? There it is. Now, what I have noticed about... You guys, I've gone to school on this child. What I've noticed is that even though we raise to, when you're raising your own children, you don't see things because you're so busy raising them. And you're just trying to survive. But when you're a grandparent and you don't, you don't have to feed them or change them or clothe them or put them to bed, you just have to spoil them play with them, and pay for the damages. <laughs> you start to see things you didn't see when you're a parent. Here's what I noticed. I'm going to get philosophical on you. One is I noticed that every child is born with instincts. You don't have to teach these things to children. They naturally have them. And those instincts are conducive or tied to their survival. The better they get at these instincts, the more likely they are to survive in this world. Second, I noticed that these instincts are all modeled by other adults in the room who are more proficient in them. And the children watch the adults do these things. And as they watch big people do these things, they try to imitate them and they get better at them. Third, I notice that they're bad at all of these instincts. 
They're terrible at them. And they fail and fail and fail. And right when you want to say, oh, quit already, they just try it again. And fourth, the more they try, the better they get. And the better they get, the better their chances of doing well in this world. Here's three instincts for sure. One is eating. All children eat. <laughs> you, you never have to teach them this. You have to control the diet, but you don't have to teach them to eat. Sucking is innate. Then it turns into hard foods or soft foods. And it goes from there. Second, walking. Now, again, you never have to say to a child, now you should stop sitting there and walk and then teach them to crawl. Here, let me show you how to crawl. They just seem to innately see people moving in the room and think to themselves, man, that looks pretty good. I think I'm going to try that. So ours is just walking now, and she sent one of him chasing the vacuum cleaner, and he's going giddy as he could be and falling, then giddy and falling and giddy and falling. I'm thinking, man, come on. But the bet, and then all of a sudden he fell one last time. Oh, I'm so excited. What he, he, he went to get back up like this, and as he got back up, guys, I'm, sorry, I'm just talking guys. We got back up, he kind of went into a three point stance like that. <laughs> I went, whoa, man. He's headed for the end. He could play for the Lions now, but he is headed for the NFL, baby. I mean, you see, I'm just, you look at these things, and when you see them, you celebrate them, and you film them, and you send them to other people. You post them on Facebook and bore everybody. And third, I notice nobody has to teach them how to talk. It starts out as a primal cry. Then the longer you have them, you notice the cries sort of coalesce around certain themes. And then after that, you start noticing there are different kinds of cries. And then the attentive parent starts to count the seconds in between the cries. When they fall and they let out that first scream, we used to go, is he hurt? One, two, three. Before that last, they can, he's hurt, we better go. You know what I mean? It starts out with a cry, and then from there, it goes into babbling. And what I've noticed is, while we're talking in the room, which in our house is all the time, they will get close, and they will start looking at your mouth while you're talking, and they will start touching your mouth. They're trying to figure out how those noises come out of that big person's mouth. So I'm seeing this as an extremely formative time in a child's life, so I'm trying to talk more slowly and deliberately say what go blue say that say that and he will go go, 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 go buckeyes like, so I go get soap and wash his mouth out it's just, <laughs> what I've noticed is that all four of these things are born into him and they become more proficient in these things by watching other people who do them well do them. And I notice that even though they're not proficient now, they keep trying, and the better they get, the further their horizons in this life. Can you imagine how low are the horizons of a child that never learns to eat or walk or talk? You say, where are you going with this long, winding story? Oh, I don't know. I just wanted to know. I know. Relax. I believe this is what Paul is trying to say in Romans chapter 8. Let me give it to you straight up. He's trying to take prayer out of the realm of a learned behavior, and he's trying to move it into the realm of an instinct. Paul is saying when we pray, it is a primal instinct that is born inside of us. That's a game changer for some of us. Let me give you Paul's argument. 
he says that there are two predominant dispositions of your soul. One is to be oriented around the flesh or the physical body, things that make you happy or things that you want. The other is the disposition of the spirit or things that please God, things that God wants for you. Those are two different dispositions, says Paul. Now, each of these dispositions, he says, have different desires. So in Galatians 5, he says, the person who thinks predominantly about themselves is often involved in everything from sexual immorality to lewd speech to envy to jealousy to hatred to dissensions to drunkenness to all sorts of behaviors. And the person who is oriented around the spirit has desires that are about love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faith and humility and self-control. Now what Paul is saying is both of these dispositions have different outcomes. And what Paul is saying is when you are born again, God has put his spirit inside of you. Let me say that differently. You have a life that has been planted in you that is not you. It is attached to you. It depends on you. How you act and how you feed your mind will affect that life that is inside of you, but God has put that spirit, that new life inside of you, and that is what makes you a child of God. Now, now, now follow his argument. This is a game changer because it means that you not only have God's standards in front of you, you actually have God's life in you. You may not know this. You may feel like you're all alone in your pursuit of the righteous life, but it isn't true. What is in you is God's spirit and it is alive. And as you feed it and as you teach it to walk, it takes over more and more of you until your life becomes his life. But that life is already inside of you now. This isn't something that you need to make happen. That means that all of the instincts of God have been planted inside of you. You have a natural, innate desire to eat. So Peter would say, as newborn babes crave milk, so you should crave the milk of the word. If a baby's not eating, we don't call this an alternative lifestyle. We call it sick. If a child of God does not have a natural appetite for the word of God, something is wrong. Some remedial action needs to take place. All right, I'm going off script for a second. I think instructions are overrated and desire is underrated. Americans are fond of saying, I can't do anything because I don't know how. It's as if the secret lies in information that is outside of us. And when I get that information, then I will know how to do it. The truth of the matter is, the answer to how is yes. Yes. Anything is better than waiting. Do something. It's better than waiting. If a child of God is not trying to learn how to walk, there's something wrong. You gotta come around people that take. If a child of God is not by nature calling out to God, there's something wrong. So my point is prayer is an instinct. It is the spirit that God has put in you just calling it. It's not something you generate. It doesn't originate in you. It originates in God who is in you. It's not something you make up. It's something God does because he wants to talk. Are you still tracking? 
But while prayer is an instinct, the way that we pray is learned. And the way that we learn to pray affects so much of our lives. And so, I propose that the best way to pray is like a kid. I know some of you are, uh, you were raised like I did, Lincoln Memorial. And so it's hard for you to imagine that you would come to God in the disposition of a child. It's more natural for you like me to come to God in the disposition of a servant to a king. But can I remind you of a few things that might help you get there? It's helped me. Number one, before he is anything else, God is a father. I didn't say that's a label. That's not a metaphor. That's his essence. He is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you tracking? So in other words, if he is not a father, he cannot exist. Because from the foundations of the world, he was a father to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's what he is. Now, I understand that some of our fathers have damaged his reputation. I just want to hold that place for him. He had the title first. And every other father is supposed to be in imitation of that, for better or worse. So in some ways they've missed, in some ways they're close, but nobody on earth can adequately represent what God has in mind when he calls himself Father. It's what he is. Second, therefore Jesus, when praying to him, always called him Father except for one time. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every other time he began with a conversation calling him Father. And third, therefore to be in union with Jesus Christ which is what I believe the goal of the Christian faith is, is to be able to address the Father in the way that the Son addresses him. It is to be able to pray like Jesus. So even if this is not natural for us, consider that it might be a height in prayer uh, that for so many, feels out of reach. Oh, can you imagine if you could have a conversation with God the way Jesus did? Can you imagine what that would do to you? I mean, what it would do to things around you? How things would change? How do we do that? Enter Abraham. I'm almost done. Relax. Abraham. You guys, here's what I notice when I'm reading Abraham's life. I've been misreading it. These, uh, there are several conversations that God has with Abraham. And if you think of it like this, prayer is nothing but a conversation with God. That's it. And if you take that as the definition of prayer, then every time you see God and Abraham talking to each other, it's actually a form of prayer. And what I noticed is that while Abraham grows up in his faith, the image of who God is changes. And when that changes, the image of who Abraham is also changes. And then that changes the conversation. Are you still tracking? All four of you, that's good. So when this whole thing began, Abraham is making altars. Nobody knows what he says. He's just making altars. And he has this kind of ancient, different religion. 
God could be one of the planets or someone that ruled the planets. He's a creator, a sovereign of some sort, but he's not personal. And so he makes altars in chapter 12 and chapter 13. But in chapter 15, when Abraham makes another altar, you saw Reni divide those things. He, this is another level of God. God is making a covenant. The ancients had a practice of two people who wanted to make a covenant. They would take animals, cut the animals in half, move them on opposite sides, creating an aisle down the middle. And then the two people in covenant would walk through those severed parts, reciting their vows or their covenant to one another. It was a symbol of saying, may what has happened to these animals also happen to me if I fail to keep my word in this covenant. So, as Abraham severs the parts of the animal, it's God and not Abraham who walks through them. Not two, but one. Suddenly, this one who was invisible meeting me at an altar is meeting me in person. And he is making rash promises that only he could. This is a different kind of God, and it's a different kind of Abraham. Then, in chapter 18, comes the clincher for me. I'll try to reenact it. I'm not an actor. You remember Dave's sermon last week, right? How Sarah was in the tent, and the three men came to see her. And she laughed, and one of the men said, why is Sarah laughing? And she said, I did not laugh. And the voice said, though several yards away, yes, you did laugh. Absent did a great job saying that last week. He sounded like God with an accent. Yes, you did laugh. Went, whoa. Okay, right after that scene, right after that scene, the three men get up, and they walk to the edge of the camp. Abraham is walking alongside of them. Suddenly they stop at the edge of the camp and they look out over the valley and down below are the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. You can see the lights, the fires burning around the camps. And all of a sudden, one of the three men turns to the other in the presence of Abraham and he says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do. This is God having a conversation with himself. Another one says, well, Abraham has been blessed. He will father many nations and others will be blessed through him. You might want to tell him. And another one says, but look at Sodom. The things I hear about Sodom are bothering me, and I don't know whether they're true or not. So I'm going to go find out for myself. Are you getting the picture? So the three men turned to walk away, and here's where the passage is powerful. It says, but Yahweh remained, and Abraham remained standing in front of Yahweh. Only the early Hebrew texts have it the other way around. They say it was Yahweh who was standing in front of Abraham. So here you have it. At the edge of the camp, we have Abraham standing in front of Yahweh, and Yahweh is standing in front of Abraham. And then it says, Abraham approached Yahweh. Let me just remind you, this is unthinkable for any other religion. Now watch the negotiation begin. Abraham says, Yahweh, you're thinking about destroying Sodom because of the evil, but what if there are righteous people there? Do the evil people have more authority than the righteous people? 
If you would destroy the city for the evil, why would you not spare the city for the righteous? Abraham says, if you can find 50 people in the city who are righteous, will you spare it? Yahweh says, all right, 50 people. Abraham steps back for a moment, thinks about it, and he says, what about 45? <laughs> I want this guy to help me get my next car. He says, will you really destroy a city just because of five people different? Yahweh says, all right, 45. Abraham leans in and goes, well, all right then, 40 it is. <laughs> Yahweh smiles and says, all right, 40. Abraham steps back for a moment. He says, you drive a hard bargain. Clearly, if you want to destroy them, you'll do it. But if you don't, what about 30? Yahweh smiles and says, all right, 30. Abraham says, I feel almost ashamed to say anything, but would you take 20? Yahweh says, all right. For 20 people, I'll spare the city. Abraham steps back and says, all right then, 10 it is. <laughs> There's a pause. And Yahweh says, for 10 people, I will spare the city. Then, it says, the three men left for Sodom. And Abram went back to his tent. That is a striking conversation. Does anybody in the room doubt that if you could talk to God like that about anything, it would change you? And does anybody doubt it would change the place where you work? If you could negotiate like that for the city of Marion, do you think it'd be a different city? Or for the schools? Or for your offices? If you have five people you're praying for and you could get Yahweh alone for 10 minutes and bargain like that, does anyone doubt that would change the destiny of those five people? Because I don't. I think there is a familiarity here that is more like a child than a servant. He's not negotiating with Lincoln and the memorial. He's negotiating with a father. He just doesn't use the language. So if we were to begin to pray like that, can I give you a few things that I think would change our disposition? Then I'm going to wrap it up quickly. One, awareness. The most important time in your prayer is before you ever say a word. It is putting ourselves into a state of mind where we begin to focus on the person we are talking to. Now, remember I told you a couple of years ago that there was a table with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at it, and there was a fourth chair at that table. And to pray was to come into the community of God and Tell them what is on your mind. This is the same case here, except the table is portable. Abraham is not leaving what he's doing in order to go talk to God. He's walking with God to the edge of the camp. And there at the edge of the camp, he's having a normal conversation with God about the thing that is on Abraham's mind. So the first thing we must do is to imagine ourselves at the community or the table of God where we are having a conversation with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that can happen anywhere. Second is boldness. Notice Abraham, no, Abraham is saying things to Yahweh that you would never say. Will you really destroy people for five different, just a difference of five? This is not like you. 
That's not who you are. You see a tenacity and a language and an aggression in Abraham's prayers that you just don't see in many Christians. If it helps you, say to God when you want to rant, <clears throat> Father, I need a 50% discount on everything I'm about to say. Maybe three-fourths of it isn't true, <laughs> but I got to say it. And then just tell him what is on your heart. You keep thinking that you have to have this formal language. Oh, and you create these superlatives. When you're a child, your daddy looks at you and says, I know who I am. Talk. And you start the conversation in the middle. You don't have to start at the beginning. And you don't have to always wrap it up. Therefore, in Jesus' name, there, I paid for it now. And then move on. You talk to him almost in guttural ways. And when you're through, you go back to the camp. But be bold. Never, ever, ever, ever underestimate the power of a child's ask to a father. Two weeks ago, I sat with a cookie on my knee. That kid walked up and just leaned on my knee and looked at that cookie. And then he looked at me and back to the cookie and back to me. And this went back and forth. And I said to him, you can't eat this. This is big people food. You're not ready for this yet. He wouldn't move. By the end, he ate half of my cookie. <laughs> Never underestimate the power of a child's ask if he won't go away. Ever. Ever. Some of you are quitting too early. Third, your prayer is a conversation. It's not a monologue. It's not a list. There are two people talking, not one. How many of you talk to yourselves? May I see your hand? The rest are lying. Come on. <laughs> Let's push it. How many of you argue with yourselves? May I see your hand? You need counseling. <laughs> Third, how many of you people uh, lose that argument sometimes? <laughs> Here's the good news. You are in a perfect position to learn how to pray conversationally. You just, no one ever told you this. A conversational prayer is simply taking the thoughts that you have to yourself and saying them in the presence of God. Let me say it differently. Prayer is not always a different kind of language, not the Abba prayer. The Abba prayer is your language in the middle of the sentence spoken out loud because it's in your head. Writes Henry Nouwen, and he's right about this, the difference is not so much in the thoughts that you have, it is to whom you present them. So it's no longer your thoughts had in your presence. It's your thoughts now had out loud in God's presence. And then it is followed by periods of silence. Silence. So the heart can hear God say something back. And sometimes it helps to articulate that and say, wait, wait, what are you saying Fourth, last, pray out loud. Talk out loud. It's like Zen just now. Do that out loud. Here's what, we, here's what we know. When they survey people who pray, watch this. More than four out of five people who pray Pray in silence. 
84% of them pray in silence. What I mean is they close their eyes and they just go like this. I'll stop. 13% of the people are alone, but they talk out loud. And the rest of them almost always pray in the company of others. This is where it struck me. When I was a kid, you guys, I grew up in prayer meetings. There were adults praying all over. So I was always exposed to watching other people pray. And some were really good and some were not that good. But as a child, I always saw it modeled. Now let me go back to the other point. Children not only have an instinct to talk, they learn how to talk by being in a room with other adults who are talking. What's happening in the contemporary church today is nobody's talking out loud anymore. Four out of five of us pray alone, and most of us never open our mouth. So how then are children supposed to see this modeled if they're never in an environment where it's modeled? The only prayer they see modeled is happening up here in the morning worship service, and almost none of us pray an Abba prayer up here. If somebody did, we'd think something was wrong. The prayers that we do on the platform, good as they are and we need to keep doing them, have a beginning and they have an end and they follow a theme and they have a nice soft landing. And some of you are watching that going, oh, man, oh, I could never do that. Uh, how much could you learn if you were just in a circle and you heard somebody talk with more or less proficiency? It speaks volumes about needing to do this at home with our kids, doesn't it? I often talk to men. This is often the case with men. Men are often though not always as eloquent as their wives, and they don't want to be bad at anything. And so I've been in homes with people and tried to lead the family in a time of prayer when a man would pray for the first time. I think it was the first time that he ever prayed out loud. And he didn't know where to start. He didn't know where to end. But he prayed. He talked. Man, I couldn't have been happier. I, 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 just talk. Just open your mouth and talk. Don't worry about how it sounds. Don't worry about if you're in the right frame of mind. Did I use the right words? I don't even know what to say. Talk. Just open your mouth and talk to him.